examples that, that I've helped work with clients over the last 10 years where we've taken the output of an IFM model um, and then applied actual, we've done actual marketing campaigns around it. So it will all kind of just come together and we'll understand how can we actually target these uh, segments of people. So, <laughs> man literally spends 24 hours finding a needle in a haystack. This actually happened. I think it was in Japan. Yeah, it was some art thing. But look, I think that this is a common scenario for a lot of people. So you've got tons of data. Um, and, you know, the marketing guys are saying, we need to run a strategy. We need to identify who are our best customers, who are our worst customers, which customers have churned. Uh, how do we figure that all out? So we're going to try and find these needles in haystacks, but in a nice, simple and a visual way to do it. So brief history of RFM history. I'll go over the slides really quick and then we'll just start digging into the actual data. Um, so RFM has been around for a while. So RFM is, uh, as we've already said, it's recency, frequency, monetary. So these are three, you can also, you may have heard it as an RFV, V for value. Um, so if we just kind of, we think about orders data, which is the perfect example. Um, you know, you've got your online sales database, these sales are coming in. Um, what we're gonna do is, is easily through three data points, based on someone's recency, frequency, and monetary value, we're actually gonna to start to drop these people into different box, boxes. We don't need any heavy code. This is literally, you can probably do it with like five, 10 lines of SQL. Um, and the output is where the value comes. Uh, it's quick and accurate, um, providing you've got accurate data, right? Bad data in, bad data out, that's obvious. But what we'll do is um, we'll quickly get to a model within, you know, well, in this session, we'll do it within the session. In reality, you could probably knock something like this up in an, in an hour if you're confident and understand your data models. And yeah, it's commonly used with sales, but it can be extended. So you see over here on the right hand side, I'm in the way. So these can be extended out of more the, the standard RFM into something that can be applied a lot more to maybe a bit more to a different business, um, a business model, for example. Uh, an RFD can be based on web browse time. So it's recency and frequency, which are still the same metrics. Um, but D is really the dwell. So how long are people, which is the value. Um, RFE uh, is another one. It's very similar to the web engagement and page visit stuff. But the, the core one is the one at the bottom where you can really extend RFM and you say, right, I can also detect churn. So this is something that Netflix will do. These kinds of subscriber based services will do. Netflix will do it with a load of AI and no one will ever know what the hell's doing it and how they're figuring it out which we'll also talk about um but yeah the rfm tc one is really it's used a lot by telephone providers you know just subscription based even gyms just to understand when someone's going to churn and actually with all of that data once they've got it the more data you've got the more likely you're able to then predict when you see someone for the very first time when they're probably going to churn so there'll be you know attributes coders versus beer drinkers you know there'll be these attributes whether you're you know certain age groups certain demographics and eventually based on the more data you've got you'll be able to actually detect when you see someone for the very first time within you know an 80 percent i guess uh 80 percent um marker you'll be able to actually see when people are going to start to churn or, or know in advance which is really cool because you can start targeting them before they start slipping away so what are they? Recencies, we've already said, let's just go over it one more time. Uh, so recency is the freshness or the, the, the customer activity. So when did they last purchase? Um, the frequency is, as we've already said, it's how frequent they purchase. So if you've got someone who's only ever purchased one time, um, are they, are they a, a good customer? Are they, are they loyal or are they not? It depends. And we're about to see why. Because just because someone's recently purchased once doesn't mean that they're a bad customer it probably means they're a new customer which means that we can handle those in a different way and the monetary value you know speaks for itself there's two ways if you apply it to sales that you could do it you can do it based on the total or on the average um, it kind of really doesn't matter but you'll see you know if you start to see these models you'll see a split 50 50 so i think average is probably a good way to do it but we're going to do it on the sum today so <laughs> smart italian genius this is Vilfredo Pareto. I don't know if people have heard of the Pareto theory. Um, so in a nutshell, it's, you know, 20% of your customers, if you apply it to business, 20% of your customers make up 80% of your revenue. So if you've got a customer database of 100,000 people, in reality, 80,000 80, of those people are almost certainly just not doing anything 
um, and as scary as it sounds, we always try to suggest and recommend when I'm out consulting with customers to get rid of the people that you don't need because in reality, they just impact a load of other things further on down the road, um, especially when it comes to things like email marketing. Um, and the reason that RFM exists, just to quickly go back, is that it was used back in the day for direct marketing. So those annoying leaflets you get through the letterbox with your name and address on, you know, companies are paying money to, to print and deliver that stuff. So it was used years ago to try and reduce uh, the marketing team's um, financial efforts so that they could just make sure they were targeting people that would actually respond as opposed to just trying to send everybody out a, a, a catalog or some kind of flyer that in reality, most people are just gonna throw up and put in the bin. Uh, so the 80-20 rule is one way of um, segmenting RFM output. And again, we'll, we'll look at that. The approach that we, we, you, you'll see generally used is the percentiles and quantiles. So what are they? Those are just buckets. So if I've got uh, 100 people, uh, I just want to put 100 people into 10 buckets. The, end, the we'll, just put, we'll just drop people into 10 buckets and they'll just roll into the next bucket, the next bucket, and the next bucket until we put everyone into enough buckets to say, that's done, we're going to go with that approach. Um, and then there's more custom-based approaches where you need to have business and domain knowledge um, because sometimes just the out-of-the-box rules don't always apply. But the majority of the time, the out-of-the-box rule will apply. Three steps, I am not from Argentina. Uh, <laughs> so it's three basic steps to how to cal calculate the RFM. One, you score the data, um, which again we're gonna do, uh, which is the buckets that I talked about, because we wanna plonk people into these buckets. When we've got them in the buckets, we wanna run the analysis. Um, I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure Messi was actually analyzing much here. Everyone remembers this, right? <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so you wanna run the analysis part, which is really eyeballing the data. Um, starting to look at the data, pivot it, visualize it so that you can actually start, start to see where the volumes sit within these segments. Um, and then ultimately you want to crystallize the common strategy. So what does that mean? Well, we've got a process now, we know it works. So we've ticked those first two boxes. How do we then answer, uh, again, going back to Rory's point, the marketing team or whoever's asking for this information, give me this information. Well, right now we've crystallized it. We'll, we'll, we'll stick a report on top of it and then those guys can go and run off the reports whenever they want. Why would they want to do that? Well, because they want to get some idea of understanding where customers are sitting within the business, but also where to also invest their marketing budget. And again, we'll go over that. So step one, scoring. I promise we will go straight in. We're going to go into some SQL. Uh, so uh, essentially, we're going to assign these num numerical number numbers, which are going to categorize people into three categories. Um, we will score them. Uh, we'll give them a number from like one to five. Depends on the volume of your database. You know, companies with like two million customers will probably go for like 10 buckets, um, but they've got more spend power, more strategy, bigger tech to throw at the customer, more channels to target them on. Um, and I guess it's good for, for this example, perhaps we, if we just think about email marketing, because it's a pretty powerful way to target these people. Um, uh, we'll bin the people and then timeframes is just something to call out. What we're going to do is we're just going to run it on a data set that I, I pulled down from Kaggle. Um, I'm not going to apply any timeframes. I'm just going to let it run over the entire, da the entire database. But something to bear in mind that an RFM, probably you want to run it over maybe the last year of data or the last two years of data. It depends how much data you've got. Because if you run it on older data, it could skew your numbers. Um, but it's just something to, th to, to think about. The analysis run. By the way, if anyone's got any questions, please stop. Uh, you know, stick your hand up, throw some questions out. Not you. Um, assign, uh, he just wants to go to, he wants to watch the, uh, the classic on. Um, so we're gonna assign a score. So assign a score to the CRM base, what does that mean? So when I uh, got a bit of your demographic D type data, I've got the, I can understand your purchasing behavior down here, but when I've got it, I might wanna apply another layer of segmentation. So I might wanna segment age groups. I might wanna segment, segment based on demographic, uh, location, uh, favorite products. Um, so this is why it's interesting to also pull this additional metadata that strengthens these buckets. Um, we'll combine the scores to create one number and it will make more sense when we see it in a minute. Uh, and then we'll analyze and group the people and refresh and create personas. So refreshing it is when we put it into, some, into production. Um, we obviously need to make sure that we're updating this data because people are purchasing all the time. 
So what we're going to see is what we call segment migration. So people will move from one segment, one bucket, into another bucket. So here's an example. Uh, we haven't seen someone purchase for six months. How do we get that person to make one more purchase? We want them to repurchase. And if they purchase, and if, if we haven't seen them for six months, they could be um, a number one or a number two. Depends what order we value our customer. But let's say that one's the lowest, five's the highest. They might be a one for the, for the recency. We get them to make one purchase, they shoot up to a five. So we've moved them out of one, one bucket and they've gone to another. So it's really cool to try and visually see how we're manipulating the customer because that's in essence what we're doing, right? Yeah, sorry, just one thing I guess. Um, uh, yeah, Rory, if you've got some water. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just like the, the scores, like five by five, one by one. Is it like every single score is like a dimension? Or like just, are we looking at the matrix? Correct. You know what I mean? Yep. Like trying to move yep. like a one person from like a five dimension, a dimensional display to a five dimensional display. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Oh, okay. Yep. So what we can do, it will be clearer in a minute, I promise. What we're doing is you can focus on certain things, right? So a company strategy may be, right, we've got a lot of people in this segment. Now, now that we've an analyzed the data, we've got a lot of people that sit in this segment of haven't purchased in the last six months. And let's imagine it's 20% of your customer base. That might be, thanks. It might be a big number that then we say, okay, right, our, our marketing strategy over the next month is to get these people to purchase again. So then you just target those people and you can target them in a number of different ways. So email is, is the classic way. And again, we'll see real life examples of what types of campaigns and strategies can we get people to behave how we want them to behave. I mean, we're just data manipulators is what this is. <laughs> we're all manipulated every single day. <laughs> uh, sorry, create, create personas. Create personas. Um, uh, I don't want to associate this to alcohol. Um, <clears throat> create personas. So uh, I'll apply it to, to the boat in industry. So, you know, there's people that are like first time, uh, people that first time, you know, been on a boat. There are people that are seasoned boaters uh, or seasoned holidays or family holidays. So we're putting people into these personas and it's very common for people to say, right, uh, the, there's, a, there's people that are male. Uh, they generally like fast cars and motorbikes and sporting events and there's lots of these attributes that we can define a persona on and those guys will always hire speedboats and they're always within the 45 to 55 year old age group so these are personas so you can do them in different you can cut these dimensions in different ways so it really depends on the industry you're applying this to but under the bonnet of it all is an IFM model almost certainly the personas are just being stuck on top uh, yeah, and as I said, crystallize the come strategy. So this is where we're going to talk about how we, you know, how, what is the message we're going to so try and send to get people to do what we want them to do, like magicians. Um, take care of over communicating, because just because you can email someone doesn't mean you should. Uh, again, if we apply the eighty twenty rule, you know, we really want to be talking to the twenty, not the eighty. If the eighty are showing no interest, why waste our efforts? Um, and right message, right offer, right time. Again, that will come through the RFM model. And yeah, the other best thing that we should be doing is learning from our high value customers. So what is it that our high value customers are doing that makes them high value? You know, what can we learn from those people to then try and take, you know, it may be that you can't do anything, but there's deeper, you know, these are going to, you're going to ask more questions once you see the data. And here's some examples. So this is um, Data Marketing Agency in the UK, Association in the UK. Um, they've got some pretty cool stuff on their website, so if anyone did want to scan that, then feel free to. But it will, this will take you right off to the RFM page. But they've got some pretty cool stuff and guidance on how to do some really funky stuff with data. Um, so yeah, so these are these are pretty common. These are things that when I work with customers, I see quite a lot. They're pretty common groups. So the, the DMAs have come up with like 11 groups that they feel can apply to pretty much any business. So, you know, if we work from our top down champions, you know, as, as you've already seen, we've got our four fives, four fives, five, five, fives, four, four, fours. It'll all come clear in a minute. Loyal customers, you know, they're just they're a little bit low on the recency score. The potential loyalists, you know, they don't spend as much. But, you know, if we can get them to spend a bit more, they frequently spend. But can we get them to spend a bit more? Uh, the promising customers, recent customers, which I said, so they could be very high spenders. They've recently purchased. Um, but sorry, low spenders, but they, they've recently purchased. So we can see if we can try and get those guys to keep coming back. And then you start falling into this danger zone. 
And this is really where you start finding the marketing team needing to focus their strategies because what they're trying to do, you know, we know it's cheaper to, to re-engage uh, re uh, or reactivate an existing customer than try and acquire a new customer. So acquisition of new customers, cool, right? Let, let that come in. RFM model goes on top. They fall into one of our strategies. These are the guys that are probably the 80%. And that's where you tend to find a lot of customers, uh, uh, clients or businesses trying to reactivate these people. Any questions? Cool. This now looks a little bit clearer, right? <laughs> so this is basically, you know, it's just a tree map visualization, which is showing if you were to cut up your database, what does it look like? Okay, cool. So new customers are over here promising, the hibernators, champions are always going to be the smaller base. It's the 80-20. Um, and then it's, you, you, know, you start moving into this area and you go, right, needs attention. And that's because they haven't purchased for some time. Uh, they, they, and it could be that some of those were good purchases, the high value purchases, but we're not quite sure. So we need to dig into those group of people. So I think that really creates that, you know, exact visualization of where you think you, where, where the marketing team, for example, would want to invest their, their, their time and money. Okay, and then the last thing I want to go into demo. Um, so what about ML and AI and chat GPT? <laughs> well, so I've implemented ML and AI models, right? for like large, large customers. I hate them, but you know, when a customer says I've got X millions and they want to invest over the next couple of years, you don't say no. An RFM model will always work for them, but actually in reality, to justify taking their money, <laughs> you need to go with an ML and A model. Um, listen, I think people have heard enough of ChatGPT, ML, AI, most people in reality don't get it. And I'm not talking about people here. I'm just saying you know, general Joe public. Uh, Chat GPT is all the rage. And if one more person says to me, <laughs> Chat GPT told me this. Um, so what are other approaches? So other approaches, they're more complex. You, they're more, way more expensive. Uh, so there's clustering that we can do, which is pretty cool, looks great. Uh, there's types of clustering, which K-means or DB scan. You know, K-means is sort of generating these number of groups. Heard that one before, right? You know, RFM can do that. Um, but they just give you nice, these nice little dots on a graph and they go, well, look, there's an outlier over there. Well, RFM can give you an outlier as well. Um, so, you know, there are expensive ways to do this, but implementing an, uh, an AI model to do what we're going to do now is going to take months. You're probably going to need a decent coder or um, at least a data scientist. Um, the priory algorithms don't even get me started. You know, it's what, this is what we call market basket analysis. So it's like, you know, it's not even a recommendation engine. It's better than a recommendation engine. It's not like, you know, Amazon goes, well, this person also bought this person and this. One. It's more trying to identify where you see someone for the very first time based on all the historic data that you've got. Can we already predict what they're going to buy? And it is pretty cool. So out of all of them, <laughs> It's the one I would go with. Um, but listen, clustering and K-means, you can implement it, absolutely. It will definitely do the job, but it's expensive, longer go to market, and way more expensive to maintain, uh, higher resource. Uh, so pretty much what I've said, high cost of creation, usually requires a data scientist. Um, I put a line through that, but you get my point. Um, lacks human creativity. It's massively difficult to maintain, and, and almost certainly nobody ever watches the model once it's built and then something goes wrong underneath, you know, I know, the developers, um, you know, so they release a, a change to the, to, the, to the product, database goes a bit wonky, all the products start coming through with, I don't know, zero value, no one checks the ML model, because that's scary as hell, and all the scientists can take care of that, they're not looking at anything. So what you, end, what you see over time is bad output. And these things, are, uh, people believe in these things. So, what could go wrong? <laughs> right, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna go and get some data, we're gonna stage it, we're gonna query it, we're gonna RFM it, and we're gonna visualize it. Um, and I'm gonna do all of that in like 30 minutes. So, let's go for it. So, 
Uh, I've already downloaded the data set, but just for people that, you know, are maybe, you know, I know there are some people here that are new um, and trying to sort of get into the world of data and tech. So there's a website I use quite a lot. It's old news now, but it's a website called Kaggle. It's got tons of data about absolutely pretty much anything. There are other ways to get data as well, which we'll see any second now. But, you know, listen, if you want some pretty straightforward data sets, just go to Kaggle. Um, don't mess about. So I downloaded the data set already. Um, and we're going to just stage it into BigQuery. So what's BigQuery? Everyone know what BigQuery is? Anyone? Nobody? Yeah? It's a big fat database. So, uh, you know, AWS has got their own version. Redshift, BigQuery is just huge, massively performant tables that are there to design. They're designed to just crunch massive amounts of data. I probably wouldn't put an RFM model in it unless I've got more than, I don't know, 50,000 customers maybe. Um, it just depends, but you know, it's no problem putting your RFM stuff into BigQuery. It's just a table of data, right? We're about to say it's just a table of data that we're going to export into Excel or your favorite little, you know, rectangular editing tool. Um, so I've already staged this data, but um, just trust me, I literally just got a CSV of data and I just imported it. So what did I do? I got this data set, which is, I got it from Kaggle. Um, Walmart, we all know what Walmart is, right? <laughs> Isn't it with the American Astas? Um, so this is basically the data set. So imagine these are our orders because that's exactly what this is. Grain is really important here. So we need to make sure that we've got the data at the right grain. As you can see here, we've actually got it at an order grain because there's multiple order IDs. So this is one order. So this person made one order at, you know, quantity times the sale, 30 quid. Um, but this group here, the 115s, that's all one order. Okay? So grain is really important when we do RFM. We just want one row of data about the customer. And all we want is the last order date. We want the total sum of their revenue, the value that the customer offers. And then their frequency will be the count of the number of times they've ordered. Okay, I'm gonna write some SQL. So that data I've staged into BigQuery right now. So let's just have a little look, just to prove there's no magic, no wizardry going on here. So that is exactly the same table thing that we just saw. I've just put it into a database so we can write some SQL over it. So let's go. I'm just going to query the database really quick just to show you that the raw data is there. So this is the RFM table. Uh, BigQuery uses this really funky um, symbol. And I don't know why they do it. It is extremely frustrating to pull up the suggestions. Okay, we're going to do it another way. So I'm just going to grab this query. I'm just going to walk you through the query. So we've all seen the good old select star from developers love it. <laughs> so what's this going to do? It's just basically going to give me every single bit of information in the database without the group by statement, because that would be really silly. So I'm just going to say, show me all the data in that table. It's exactly what I just showed you already. It's just a preview of the table. But what I want to do, I've, I've eyeballed the data and I've realized actually what I need to do is I need to aggregate this data up. So what we're going to do here is aggregate it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to pull out the, a unique ID about the customer. In this example, it's customer name. In reality, in a database, it's probably customer ID, right? Uh, I also would strongly suggest to sort of anonymize this kind of stuff initially. Um, and then the key to doing this is always work on a customer ID and then bring it back. Uh, and then bring it back and then attach it into your CRM, okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, now you're testing out my Mac skills. Is it that? Oof, see, this resolution's not ideal. Does that, is that right? Okay, so anonymize where, wherever possible. Do your analysis out here and then bring it back and join it into your customer record. Um, so as I said, what we're going to do, we're just going to take the maximum order date, which is the last order date. We need that in order to calculate the recency. 
be careful, like I said before, just bear in mind your, your, uh, the active date range you wanna work with. Because if you work with data for 10 years ago, you're gonna have a lot of people that are out of date. So it's probably, probably better if you've got a, like an e-commerce website um, to run it on a, on a data set over the last year, for example, which is a pretty good example. And it's also, it depends on the industry, right? Holidays, people purchase once a year on average. So then you need that longer date range. But if you're selling the old fashioned Microsoft widgets, that I don't even know what a widget is, but they used to put it in all their documentation, um, they're probably gonna buy them more frequently. So your, your window can be shorter. Uh, we're taking the sales amount. So we're literally just doing the sales times the quantity because that data set was at the item level and we're gonna roll it up to a single row. And we're counting the number of orders because that's the um, frequency. And we're gonna group this by the customer. So let's just run it and let's see what we get. Oh, I'm gonna have to zoom out a little bit because I can't see all of this. So what I don't know what's happened, the whole screen zoomed in. But can you see that, yeah? Okay, so now we've got one row, brilliant. So we now we've got a customer record. We know out of all of their transactional history, we've just put it all onto one single line. So we know that when the last order date was, uh, the amount that they've spent and the number of orders they've ever had, ever, in this example. So now what do we wanna do? Well, now we need to RFMize it. So this is the same query. It's exactly the same query. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna run an outer query around it because now what I wanna do is apply the magic. And the magic is this end tile. So what does end tile really do? So we talked about the buckets. So end tile was a function in every single database in the world, even Postgres, <laughs> um, which will basically say, take all of these all of these rows of data and put them into even buckets of something. So we're gonna put them in, into even buckets. In this example, four, I think I chose four, yeah. Okay, four. Uh, why four? Just felt like four. Um, if you've got less data, you don't want loads of buckets, right? The more data you've got, probably you want more buckets. Uh, but I think this data has only had like 20,000 rows or something. So uh, I'm just choosing four. Could have been three or four or five. But that is what's gonna generate these matrices and these total numbers of segments. So it's gonna be four by the power of three, by whatever, by the power of three twice. And we're gonna end up with a whole bunch of people in a number of little places. What I also did is I am, um, if you remember seeing a, a number, you saw like a one, 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 or a two, five, five, five. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, first of all, give them a, put them, in, put them into a bucket based on their last order date. So order by the last order date, put them in groups of four buckets, um, with the top bucket being the best, second bucket being the next, et cetera, et cetera. And I just do the same for all three. Like it's literally, that's, that is it. So we do the exact same rule for the frequency based on the total number of orders. We do the exact same thing for the volume of money. People with the highest spenders, bucket, bucket, bucket. Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. Coder. You can tell the coders. They always talk in zeros and ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. It's, uh, it starts at one. It's a good question. Uh, yeah. So that's what we're doing. And then I decided to just get a little bit stupid. Uh, so first of all, the first bit isn't stupid. It just, just generates this 111555. All that is is a concatenation of just a string. Can you see that? I'll zoom in a little bit more. That is not how to zoom. Right, so we're concatenating that value just because it makes life easier and you'll see why in a second. This is where it gets a little bit, you know, you can get a bit cool about this stuff. So case statement is basically saying, if this, then that. So what I'm doing is saying, if it's a one, 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 call them lost. Hopefully I've got them the right way around. Um, so let's add another group. I'm gonna, copy this I'm gonna add another grouper in here so first ones are one one ones lost let's do the five five fives and let's just call them awesome and everyone else is just I know needs work <coughs> we're not going to use this properly but you know it's basically what we're gonna do so select the case so when, when, when I identify the one one ones give them a label when I identify the five five fives give them a label and everyone else that's not a one one or a five 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 is just putting into this other bucket of needs work let's run the query 
<clears throat> so now what you see, we've, we've, we've appended data to the end of our data set. So now we're starting to get a bit clever. So we've got our same record, exactly what we saw before, but now we're building out this, this end tile. So we've got this end tile one, end tile, end tiles. And now what we've done is over here, this is our concatenated score of all of these values together. So, you know, one, 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 or one, one, three, sorry, ignore that column. Uh, needs work, lost. There's no awesomes there at the minute. But you see my point. So when we export this data, we've now started, we've already tagged the data. So we're in essence building our segmentation strategy. And then we can start to build those visualizations of where we drop those people into buckets. So let's do this. Let's uh, export this data. I'm going to save it as a local CSV. So just in the same way we had this previous CSV, we've now got a new CSV. I get really weird when I, I've got this OCD with data. Don't ask. I just want things in tables. <coughs> so it just looks much, much nicer now. I'm going to just hide this because we don't need this. We don't need that. Uh, we don't really need that. We can just call this RFM score. And there we are. So we've now got our total database tagged. We put them into buckets. <coughs> now we need to try and get to the, the point of okay, um, we're going to analyze it and start to actually look at what our data is telling us. I'm just going to do it in Excel. <laughs> so this is how straightforward it is. I'm going to create a pivot table. Who's scared of pivot tables? It's a thing, right? It's really a thing. I love them. <clears throat> so pivot table. I'm going to take the dimension, which is customer name. I'm going to drop it in the row. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring over a recency. I'm going to plonk it there. I'm going to bring in the IFM uh, frequency. And I'm going to bring in the monetary value. So that's pretty cool. But it's the same table as we just saw, right? So what can we do here? Well, instead of just looking at our customer, we can take our customer out and we can actually just group people via their RFM scores. So now what we've got is actually a table, which is 60 odd rows of all of our customers. So if I now just want to go in and say, who are my most valuable customers? I can go into my fours and right here, I've got 92 valuable customers. That's it. We know who our customer is. How do I know who they are? Well, I'll bring in a customer name um, I won't bring the customer name I'll wait I'll drill into it instead so all I just did is double click it and it's taken me down to those absolute rows of people that we can now actually go and identify as human beings as opposed to a number and we can now start our marketing strategy same goes for our worst customers we just go for our absolute worst so we've got those customers, those are, those are the ones that are lost, you know, so straight away you can already see that you're already just segmenting your people and it's, you know, the database is ready to just be cut up and, and targeted. So if we want to know who they are, we can just bring in the customer name as well. So these are all of our customers. Imagine that's their email addresses or whatever. You can export them, put them into MailChimp, whatever people use to send emails today uh, and start coming up with a strategy. So let's just drop these into a chart and see how they look. Um, if you're afraid of pivot tables, you'll be afraid of pivot charts. <laughs> so let's just whack these people into a pivot chart. Uh, I've actually got a pie chart t-shirt on underneath. I hate pie charts. But... We've got this as a leaving present for oh. my job. They, they clearly hated me. So. <laughs> Uh, let's take a look. Let's get into some counts. So we can use our customer name. It's not a problem because the customer name is unique in this example. So we know that we've got, what well, we got here, 686 unique customers. But now I can have a look at them by segment. So clearly, none of our people fell into the group that we created. <coughs> oh, did I do 555s five, 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 and not 444s? Four, four, four? I did five five fives. Yeah. Otherwise we'd have some awesome customers. <clears throat> so the four four fours, but you see my point, if I'd have tagged them properly, 
they would have been here as another bar. So straight away, we can already see if we want to split up our customer database, we've got a hell of a lot of work to do. Um, or, or not in this case, because I just created a bad, it's a bad example. But our lost base here in this example isn't that bad. But we know in here we actually need to build 11 segments um, by tagging each one of these particular values. So we can also come in and create a combination of these. If I remove, uh, if I select everybody and I say, right, I only want to see people that are the highest spenders, so fours. So these are the people that spend a load of cash, the rich guys. Uh, this is where it could be useful to actually show the, um, the amount. So these are the guys that are spending all the cash. You can obviously work out your average from here, right? You can just take the sum and divide it by the the count of transactions. So you can actually look at who your, your highest average spenders are. Um, so these are my high spenders, but they haven't been for a while. Whoa. So that 80-20, suddenly we're like, well, hang on, how have we let these people go? These guys were spending a fortune with us. They frequently spent money. I mean, this guy spent once, right? So this person purchased once. Not a bad purchase price, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> don't read into that data right it's from Kaggle <clears throat> it's going to be anonymized and it's going to be made up but I mean it's not tomatoes right especially not in especially not in the UK but um yeah I mean they're probably talking about like if you look when we go back and look at the raw data if you go up here remember we um I think there were things like um mobile phones and weird things I'm not that a mobile phone is a weird thing here, phones, copiers, you know, they're talking like, yeah. it's almost certainly not a real data set, right? But you get the gist. So, yeah. So these are the people that we go, right, whoa. Now, if I was marketing and my business is starting to sort of decline a little bit on revenues, I'm like, what happened? Well, you've got the best part, I don't know, like 30 in this example and a bigger database, it's probably gonna be thousands of people that used to frequently purchased frequently a lot of stuff. So they were high spending customers and just disappeared. So maybe they went to the competition. So now we go into the world of why and how do we target? So the, I'm not gonna visualize anymore because I only created two groups, but I'm just gonna jump back into the presentation. Um, so in here is some actual strategies of, that, that, we've, we've actually, that I've actually applied to try and win back customers or to try and keep customers purchasing and continually coming back. So, you know, you can focus on, it really depends on the business needs, right? Um, sometimes you can generate a load of revenue just by making people transact once again. It's a different strategy entirely to trying to make someone purchase a higher priced product. That could come through a cross sell or an upsell. Um, so look, let's go over some of these strategies. Um, this is quite a nice visual, which basically kind of says, sitting on the axis of frequency and monetary down to recency, these are the groups of segments that we need to target. So we say, okay, right, let's look at, I don't know, new and promising. So before they start to, maybe they, they we don't want them to have a bad experience. You know, maybe we want to send them a survey uh, how are things going on and you know grab that data back and understand how people are purchasing but let's have a look at some of these so if we've got people that have got high recency high what well, high high rfm is you know they're the, they're the the winners they're the loyal customer i mean in reality you could just not do anything you know because if they're still purchasing at a decent rate why even give them a discount because they're purchasing um it's questionable but what you could do is things like surprise and delights um some kind of reward thanks for being a loyal customer so when we look at high recency, high frequency, high monetary, which is everybody, that's these key ones. High recency, low frequency, so one-time spenders perhaps, but they never spent a lot. So we're saying here that new, it, 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 the segment will include the newest customer, absolutely. This is my point, give them a good first impression. Let's understand welcome offers, you know, what can we do for you? How can we try and encourage you? Onboard them into our business a lot better. Maybe we need to explain our product to them. Um, who knows, right? But the, st the strategies are kind of endless once you identify your groups of people. Low recency, low, low frequency, these are like the one, one, ones. But let, you know, let's take a look. So as in marketing, 
your last engaged recipients simply may not, they may not be worth mailing. This is my point, is that I've actually told customers, we have a two million base of customers that have said, well, I've spent loads of money building that base up. You go, yeah, but 80% of them don't wanna hear from you. They're not even interested. And also, if their emails are gonna start getting blocked, if you start getting unsubscribes, if you start getting bounces, the, the email the companies are not gonna let you through anyway. So you need to protect your database as well. So just because you've got all these people doesn't mean you contact them. Uh, right time, right place, right message. So build an, you know, send them some opt-ins, send them some campaigns. Yeah, double opt-ins are really good to make sure you've got that absolute opt-in. Uh, it's also good for GDPR. Um, and high frequency, low recencies. Customers that used to frequently visit the store, whether that's online or in-store, doesn't really matter, uh, but they haven't been back for some time. Um, I actually, honestly, so I do some work. I was working with Tui, a holiday, the holiday company in the UK. Um, we had to figure out why it was about 7% of their base had stopped coming back. Can anyone guess why they, they weren't coming back? No, it's a holiday company. Holiday company. <coughs> we did this actual analysis. Because of the password that password It kind of really depends how much money you want to spend on your, on your setup, right? So you can tap into these third party data companies that will give you enriched data about the customer. So, you know, there are companies out there that will, put, will pull this data in to find out more about you. Have you changed address? You know, if I'm sending the direct mail, if you don't live at that address anymore, that's a waste of money. Um, are you deceased? <laughs> deceased is generally the reason where sometimes when you've had such a loyal customer, so what do you do? You tap that back against the customer database. It's gonna sound horrible. You look at the age, you know, and you can start to build up this picture and understand why customers are no longer coming back. Um, people change their email addresses, things like that all the time. People use their work email addresses. You know, they go, they, re they create an account, use the work email address, leave their job, and you know, you start getting bounces. So there's, there's, low, there's an art to really maintaining the database here, which is why it's so important to have this view of the data. Um, that's it really.